we reassemble for congregational services, it's no surprise that it happens to land on the recognition of Pentecost. And before I begin with the sermon uh, today, I'm, I would like to just take a moment to explain this event in early church history, because you hear it and you really don't know what it means, right? A lot of, a lot of people don't, because it's very significant. And um, we're going to address it before we, we uh, go into our uh, fifth and final part of the Old Testament series today, which is over Deuteronomy this time. Um, there's no way of me getting into the whole thing now, but allow me to just take the opportunity to share at least that the Pentecostal um, movement has nothing to do with what actually happened to the apostles in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. It's inspired them, but it's not the purpose of why what happened in, 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 the, in the New and Old Testament. This is where we have to, uh, this is where we have the record of the original Pentecost. This is found in the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as uh, of a rushing mighty wind, and it, was, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they, there appeared to be, excuse me, appeared to them divided tongues as of, whole, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, those who heard them speak in these different languages thought that they were just out of their minds, obviously, with drunkenness as they st stated that. But Peter stood in the midst of this and says, men of Judea and those of you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these um, are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, which is nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then Peter cites the, that reference in the prophecy of Joel and expands on it. The reason why this is important, it goes in the line of Jesus after his resurrection, pri excuse me, prior to his death, let's put it that way, he promised them the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit work in the Old Testament. Then after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and after a couple times in his appearance to the disciples in his resurrected body, he breathes out the Holy Spirit. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. It gives them the confidence to go on. We know that. Then he tells them at the Great Commission before he ascends into heaven, right, as the Great Commission goes, you know, now go therefore, make disciples of all nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Ascends into heaven. Now they're pumped up, they're ready to go. He tells them to go and wait for him, wait for something. They're in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They each get a different language. Why is this important? Why does this matter? You can't very well take the language that you speak only in one area and spread the gospel to all four parts of the world. When this happens, they are only at where? They're literally in Jerusalem in only a small landlocked area of land knows anything about the happenings of Jesus Christ. In order for his word to go pentata ethne to every people group, they have to have what? The ability to speak other languages. Voila. They were given each a different language, and there you go. Now, we see it take a different, complete turn in, in our society. That's a whole other topic for a whole other day, and I'll even expand on that more in the next Pastor's Corner on the website so that you guys get a little bit more about that. But you got the idea now. That was a celebration of Pente Pentecost and in the quickest snapshot I could possibly give. And there's much more to it. But uh, today's topic is stubbornness. And as we wrap up the final book that Moses wrote in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, we will look at the true stubbornness of a nation of people, the Israelites, which caused them great harm. And, and we can look at their wicked ways and their faults and actually learn from them today as we focus um, on, on our last journey through, the, through the, you know, the first five books of the Old Testament and a journey that mirrors our own problems. But first, if you would please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather Thank you for sharing the gospel with us. Thank you, Lord, for letting us share the gospel with others. Thank you for letting us be able to engage broken people everywhere. 
Lord, church isn't just a place where we go and get filled up and then go do what we want the rest of the time. This is a place where we go and we get filled up, change our lives. It's not easy. It's not overnight. We know, Lord God, you have a purpose and a plan. So today, open our ears to hear your gospel. Hear your words, your words upon our hearts. Help us to change into the people that you want us to become, not the people who we are presently. We ask, Lord God, that you would help all this in your precious name and allow me, Lord God, to share the, the message this morning, but not to get in the way of the theme, point that you're trying to get across to your children. Please speak by way of the Holy Spirit through me to your children in your precious holy name we pray. When I hear the word stubborn, I usually uh, uh, think of it as like a lighthearted compliment, right? Oh, he's just stubborn. <laughs> you might hear somebody say, but is it truly a compliment? The actual defini definition of the word means determination not to change one's attitude or position on something. So no, it's not necessarily a good thing to be stubborn. When we were lost sinners, wasn't that the attitude that kept us from the freedom that we found in Christ Jesus was stubbornness? Yes, it was. And ironically, it was the same stubbornness that plagued the nation Israel. So Moses had to expand on laws for them, okay? And this brings us to the book of Deuteronomy. There are some new things in the book of Deuteronomy, but it is a recapitulation of a lot of the laws, some new ones added. How many of us read the book of Deuteronomy? Probably about as many of us that read the book of Leviticus and Numbers on a frequent basis, right? But all there for huge importance. Let me explain why. Deuteronomy is clearly one of the most important books in the Old Testament. Although the book strongly centers on laws for God's people, those laws are surrounded by grace. Did you know that Jesus quotes the book of Deuteronomy more than any other book in the Old Testament? Or that he referred to the book of Deuteronomy in his own life more than any other book? In fact, Jesus answered all three of the temptations in the wilderness in Luke 4, 1 through 13, with quotations from the book only found in Deuteronomy. That's how important this book is. Our Savior quoted from it more than anything else. But it wasn't just our Lord. In his letter to the Romans, it was clear that the Apostle Paul drew a lot on the book of Deuteronomy to teach the law that reveals sin, for instance, in Romans 7. Or when he taught about righteousness is by faith in Romans 10, he drew from Deuteronomy. That the circumcision of the heart is necessary for true obedience in Romans 2.29 when he said, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. This understanding comes from Deuteronomy. Paul taught to love one's neighbor in Romans 11, excuse me, in Romans 13, actually. He did refer to it, but in Romans 13, that is where we find that. And we should not, not seek personal um, revenge, for instance, in Romans 12, and that we should expect Gentiles to be added to an originally all Jewish people of God when we find that in Romans 15, 10, when he said, and, it, and again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And the word Deuteronomy, meaning repetition of the law, arose from a mistranslation in the Septuagint, the pre-Christian Greek translation of the Old Testament, as well as the Latin Vulgate of a phrase in Deuteronomy 17, 18, which in Hebrew means copy of this law. But the error is not serious, um, since Deuteronomy is, in a certain sense, a repetition of the law anyway. So it really worked out, and this is very clear when we read it. Now, the book of Deuteronomy opens with these words. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. Now, before I call to worship this morning, when I read a passage from Deuteronomy, we're gonna read from the first chapter. I would like to set this up for you, okay? Now, they're in, they're in the wilderness wandering around for 40 years. A new generation is, is ready to enter the promised land now. Moses ga gathers them, okay, and delivers one final message to them. 
He recounts Israel's rebellion and God's grace up to that point, and he calls them to covenant faithfulness. And in verse six, he actually says, the Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb saying, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. And then in verse 10 of the first chapter, he says, the Lord your God has multiplied you and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number, almost three million. This speech serves as the beautiful reminder of how God's provision has been more than sufficient while they were in the wilderness, and now it's time to enter the land, which of course, as you remember, Moses did not lead them. He's not allowed to, because he has basically not allowed to because of the sin of the people, which is messed up for Moses, but planned all along, and he knows it. This is why in his speech, I'm gonna begin it at verse 19. Then we set out from Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, and as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to um, Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the, the Lord your God has set up the land before you. So go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear, be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, well, let us send men before us that, that we may explore the land for us and, and, and bring us word again that, uh, that way by which we must go up in the cities into which we shall come, because they didn't trust. The thing seemed good to me, and I took 12 men from you and one man from each tribe, and they turned and went up to the hill country. They came to the valley of Eshal and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it is good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, the, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim here, there. And I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as many as a man carries a son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night and in the cloud by day to show you what way you should go. And the next part to conclude this chapter is called The Penalty for Israel's Rebellion. It's a segue of what he's saying. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and, and he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall, be the, the good, shall see the good land that I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he, was, he has trodden, because he was holy followed the Lord. He has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me, the Lord was angry on your account and said, you also shall go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall um, cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your children, who today ha have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there. And to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn and journey to the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Then you answered me, we have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight just as the Lord commanded us. And, and every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it was easy to go up into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up and fight, for I will not be in your midst, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, and you would not listen, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord over and over again, no trust. No trust. 
at the conclusion of his speech, Moses gives a warning and an ultimatum. To listen and obey God will be to blessing. I didn't give you another slide, so why don't we just go to the introduction slide. To listen and to obey God will be a blessing, but to disobey God will lead to devastation and exile. Moses knows the people well enough to know they will eventually choose rebellion, okay? Yet even then, Moses looked forward to a future day when God would give Israel a new heart when the Messiah would come. But never good enough are the promises of the Lord, ever. Even today, man, even today. We're to trust in the Lord. And you know how many people are freaking out that there's rioting going on? I don't know how many of you were around were 30 years ago, but Rodney King riots weren't that great either. You know, it happens. Watts riots, we can go on and on in history. The one in Jerusalem in 70 AD, how about them apples? That was a riot. They were burning Christians at the stake. They're called Roman candles. This happens. Calm down. Seemed that their constant stubborn behavior is the cause for the reason why that, first, that, that generation, the oldest generation, were not allowed to go in. You mean people that would probably amount to? Moses, after all he had done, doesn't even get to enter the land, as I mentioned before, because of the sins of the nation of Israel. Instead, he has to pass the torch to Joshua, who leads them in instead. Now, you may not think of this, but allow me to ask you this question. What if God said to you, for I am not in your midst? How would that make you feel? Or, I now cut you off, or... Away, away with you, or even worse yet, I do not know you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, as one day people will hear. I would not want to let my personal stubbornness get in God's way now any more than the day I finally repented and believed in him in the first place. Remember that day for you? The day the stubbornness finally ended in your journey in your life? when you finally repented and believed in Jesus Christ, and for those who haven't yet, let me tell you, there's a moment, that's the moment of your life you'll never forget. You'll never forget. It's not the experience, it's the truth that all of a sudden sets you free. Paul said in the old covenant mediated by Moses, um, it bore a ministry of condemnation in 2 Corinthians 3.9, because Paul knew <laughs> the Torah. He knew the law of the land very, very well. And, and, and so when he becomes regenerated by Christ, all of a sudden this makes total sense. Remember, we talked about Paul was quoted by a lot of people as the super Jew. He was upholding the Jewish law. He was going to do whatever it takes to make sure people were going to follow it. He gets regenerated by Jesus, and now he's like, man, everything I knew makes sense now, but it doesn't make sense then. And he struggled with that the rest of his life. He was in torment for what he did to Christians by enslaving them and getting them into prison and killing some. He wouldn't have put it that way if he didn't believe that. Ministry of condemnation. So let's get a better understanding of all. I want you to see this, and, and then at the end, we'll swing back around and show you just how exactly it mirrors you and I today, Okay? Because if you think about it, like the book of Deuteronomy, cool, old relic book, not really my thing. All right, well, hang on a minute. Every part of the 66 books of the Bible is important for a reason. So let's show you. Book of, book of Deuteronomy, it clarifies three things. Moses, old covenant plea, the people's old covenant problem, and God's new covenant promise. So let's begin with the old covenant plea. Moses calls he called for the right things. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, and love the sojourner, which translates to people in Deuteronomy 10. And Jesus said that these are the first and second most important commands in Mark 12, 29 through 31. Right? He quotes that as the most important, most important commandment, most important law when he's asked Try to trap him. He knows what he's doing. He wrote it. 
<laughs> Amen? Moses even urged, these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart in Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. Now check this out. Jeremiah 31.33 even said this. This command sounds just like what is promised in the new covenant. This is what we call a type and a shadow of what's to come. Nevertheless, as loud as loud or as long as Moses talked, the Israelites don't listen uh, for at the core uh, of their being was the hardness, the hardness of heart, a spiritual disability and desperate need of what we call heart surgery, amen? And that moves us to number two, the old covenant problem. The old covenant problem. Three words Moses used throughout the book to describe Israel's problems are this, stubbornness, unbelieving, and rebellious. Constantly stubborn in Deuteronomy chapters 10 and 31, unbelieving in Deuteronomy 1 and 28, rebellious in chapters 1, 20, and 31, and all three occur together in Deuteronomy 9, all three of them together. Moses' old covenant plea was for love, saturated hearts filled with faith in God that overflowed in obedience because that's what he wants. He wants our hearts, he wants our hearts to love him. You know, we always think that Christianity is like the set of rules and laws. We talk about this a lot because it's such a misnomer, amen? The entire world believes that we're supposed to follow a list of rules and laws in order to get salvation. Where did you find that? You found that in religion. You did not find that in Scripture. Because Scripture is freeing. Christianity is freeing. It's the only thing that says you have to do nothing but receive and repent and believe in the Savior. That's it. Wait. I thought I got to go through catechism. I'm... Where'd you find that? Right? Right? Now, the catechism, you know how I feel about the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's phenomenal. It's on our website. That's how much I believe in it. It's a hundred odd questions that are just phenomenally brought together. Quick question, quick answer, scripture to answer it. It's beautiful. It's been around for 500 years. However, you don't have to memorize it in order to graduate to heaven. It's there for you to help you. That's what Jesus teaches us. So there's an old covenant problem, and they had to follow a list of rules. They hadn't got Christianity yet, because all they had to do was follow the rules. So if you want to sit through Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy and, and, and memorize it, feel free. 631 separate laws. 631. Feel free to memorize them, and good luck keeping them. Moses' old covenant plea was... For love-saturated hearts filled with the faith in God that overflowed in obedience, as I said before. But Israel would have none of it. Indeed, they, they couldn't. And Moses knew this. Deuteronomy 29, 2 through 4 says, reads this. You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw. Your, the, you saw the signs and those great wonders. But to this day... The Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Oh, wait a minute. What did I just read? But to this day, the Lord has given you, excuse me, has not given you the heart to understand, eyes to see or ears to hear. Huh. Well, no wonder they're so stubborn and rebellious and stupid. They weren't given the heart because they didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. You see, we just don't really care for the fact that God is in control. That's our problem. <laughs> we don't like the idea of God's, God being in control. Hey, if you go to Bill Johnson's Bethel Church, you're told you don't have to worry about it because God isn't in control. I digress. Anyway, <coughs> Church of Satan, <coughs> excuse me. Even to this day, we don't want to believe that God is sovereign. And many Christians say, yeah, God, yeah, totally, totally God's sovereign. Of course I believe that. 
God's not in control. God's not in control. God's like, <laughs> what, you, what part did you just not believe in what you said and what you uttered? That's the problem with religiosity, is it states something and then it doesn't trans, translate to the person's being and body. When you allow Jesus Christ into your life, it changes the entire complexity of everything. It changes the game. He is the ultimate game changer. Israel might have known a lot about God. They didn't know about him. Though he had seen, he, they had seen God at, you know, at one level, at a deeper level, they, they, remind, they just remained blind. They had heard God's voice, but in reality, they were deaf. Their hearts were hard. Their senses were dulled resulting in no passion, no fire, no love, and they, they remained stubborn, they remained unbelieving, they remained rebellious. They were undisciplined, impure, and condemned from the get-go, and they couldn't change it. Even, even if they knew how, do you believe that they would have? Clearly not, because we find out that they didn't. We read a couple weeks ago, Moses goes up Mount, you know, Mount Sinai at Horeb. Go get the laws. He goes up. What happens? Comes back to them worshiping a golden calf. <laughs> and God's ready to annihilate the whole lot of them. And it's his plea. Hold on. I know there's, they, they got some idiocy there, but I think I can work with that. I can work with this. Please don't annihilate them. Fair enough. Beautiful. When we, when we petition God on the behalf of ourselves and other people, it's amazing how he intersects in our lives, how he intervenes in our hearts. I mean, they sin so badly against Jehovah God that only two of the oldest generation among three million were granted permission to access the new promised land. Two of that generation. Moses, the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the patriarch who pled for the lives, as I just mentioned on, on Mount Sinai, the same Moses who, who appeared along with Elijah to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, that same Moses, um, uh, witnessed by three of the disciples. They didn't understand what they were seeing, but they knew that was Moses, they knew that was Elijah, visiting with the Lord God when he revealed his glory was not granted entry into the promised land because of the sins of the people. Your sins matter. Jesus Christ took your sins and my sins to the cross. So every time, every time we do it, we just pound another notch in that nail. But he knew what he was doing. To end Deuteronomy, both Yahweh and Moses stress how the old covenant relationship weakened as it was by the flesh, the hardened hearts of the people would result in their ruin. That's what's amazing, because Deuteronomy 29.4 actually says that, knowing, uh, that a knowing heart, seeing eyes, hear, hearing ears, all are gifts from God, according to his purposes in order to show us our need for Jesus Christ eventually. God created a covenant where he called for the right things but did not overcome the rebel and rebellious spirit of the majority of people, according to Romans 11, 7, and 8. The people were hardened, and the old covenant would ultimately bring about their death. So God the Father explicitly proclaimed that Israel's sin would climax in exile, as Moses predicted when he said this, quote, I know how rebellious and stubborn you are, Behold, even today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? And then Deuteronomy 31, 27 and verse 29 says this, I know that after my death, you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come, evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. But saints, old means temporary. Both Yahweh and God know that the old covenant was te temporary, bearing a ministry of condemnation as told to us in the New Testament. 
So Paul, speaking of God, uh, his, his ultimate um, uh, sovereign purpose for the old covenant in the first place, he continues this. Um, excuse me. In Romans 5, 21, 20 and 21, check this out. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Right? This is why God gave the law. To multiply sin. But he continues, but where sin increased, what? Grace abounded. Grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The more laws you follow, the less righteous you will be. The, the, the more you, you surrender to the grace of God given to you through the, through the beautiful atoning death and wonderful victory of resurrection and, and glorious reign of the kingdom that is now by the ascension of Jesus Christ, we are free from that slave trade. Free from it. But I don't want to follow rules. You're in the right place. Doesn't mean you got to go act a fool. Amen, somebody. It means you do something about it. There's a righteousness that you must follow, and flipping over cars and burning buildings ain't it. Not saying. That it justified anger. No, get it. I get it. <sighs> Moving on. I'm going to finish this bad boy. Does it get any sweeter than Romans 5? Lastly, the new covenant promise. Here's where we bring it in. Moses was not only convinced of the death-dealing nature of the old covenant, he also anticipated the, a, a life giving new covenant that would replace the old, a covenant that would include divine enablement, um, uh, uh, allowing the world to read the law in human lives. Moses states that after the curse had been paid in Deuteronomy 30, chapter 6, or verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So in the age of the new covenant, God calls for us to love him with our everything. And he would be matched by, by his empowerment, right? God would enable what he commands. How? Holy Spirit. That's why this day is important of recognition. But it's important every day, man. Not just the 49th day or whatever after, you know, the ascension after Easter. It's important for you to know this. The Holy Spirit indwells within each believer that surrenders to Jesus Christ. That's how this makes sense. See, the world on the outside looking in, they just think of a bunch of religious freaks. And the more religious you, the more that we see David Koresh, the more that we lump everybody together. Oh, well, that's all, you know. Oh, everybody's wacko like Waco. No, no, they're not. Okay? That's the Seventh-day Adventist offshoot called the David, you know, uh, the the, David, the Da Vinci or whatever. I don't know what, Davidian branch, right? Branch Davidians, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's a cult. It's not Christianity. Christianity does not bind people and hold them together in, 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 against their wishes and rules and rights. By the way, correct Christian leaders do not marry a 12-year-old and then consummate the marriage, by the way. That is breaking the law, that is, in, that is, that is disgusting. That I'm just getting off my tangent of watching that show Waco because the fact that they just glorified it. They made David Koresh out to be a really nice guy. He raped children. At what point do we just, like society all of a sudden is gonna think Hitler's cool? You know? No, Stalin wasn't a good man. I don't get mentality of the world, but we're never going to get it. That's why we can't make sense of it. Amen? You're not going to be able to make sense of it, so quit trying. We know by what we learn in the Word of God that the sin, the sin problem in people is what causes this problem in people. The sin of a man is what causes them to get off course. The sin of a man is what gets them into a, an addiction that they can't break out of. But we know that God is freeing 
We know that his righteousness sets us free. And through work and effort, you can do it. Thanks be to God for the new covenant of grace. Amen? Is our stubbornness getting in the way of grace in your life today? In your mind, are you so set on, on your way of doing things that it literally cripples God's ability to bless your life because of it? You know, we have religions now while we're on the topic. We have Christian sects of, of religion, of churches that say, if you don't have five, but $5 in your bank account, you just, you just pray. You, you command it by your voice to get money in your account. How about you go get a job and get a paycheck and put it in there? That's how you get money in your account. I'm not saying God isn't a God of miracles, but that's ridiculous. Where do you read that in Scripture? You don't. I'm not saying that God doesn't do amazing supernatural works, but if you think you can speak things into existence, you better go back to the Word of God because nobody can but God. We have a problem, you guys, and it's culture-wide and it's church-wide. And the only way out of it is through the gospel according to God. The 66-book canon of the Holy Bible is the only way through this mess and muck. I can get the Bible to say anything I want to, but it's never going to go against what God says unless I tell it to. God's never going to contradict himself. You will and I will every time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had to preach today, man. The ultimate aim of creation and redemption is guaranteed by the blood of Christ. And let's just say that at the end. He calls it the blood of the covenant in Luke 22 20, and it is indeed the new covenant. At the cost of his life, Jesus Christ bought the beautification of his bride and her beauty in her delight. In him, that's the goal of creation, was to bring the bride of Christ, us, the church, the believers, Jew, Gentile, again, together, one tree, not two people, one people, one tree, we're grafted in, that's the beautification of what he did through creation. On behalf of his father, Christ came to create a beautiful bride out of the rebellious people that we find in Deuteronomy. You and I, we are part of the bride of Christ as the church. And this blood, bought, beautified bride will be God's delight forever. Amen? I close back in Deuteronomy 30, 19, 20. Choose life that you are and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life. That's not too hard for you. Or I. If we just love him, and then everything changes from there. It's only as hard as enjoying what is supremely enjoyable. Amen? Pray with me. Father God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together. Lord, as we um, enter in the end of the, of the service today, and uh, Brother Larry's going to come up and, and give a, a short communion message, and then we're going to partake in communion to commune with you, to remember that on the Lord's Day, we are to, to, to take the bread and, and, the, and the wine. And, and brother, we'll talk about that in a moment. Reminding us, Lord God, that the body was broken for our behalf as part of the covenant in which you fulfilled by coming to this earth. The hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man. You took up residence in an earthly body in order to be a propitiation for our sins. How amazing is that? I don't get it. Why you would do that for such a wretched Wretched man like myself or anybody else here. But you did. So grateful for everything you do, Lord God, and we praise you and we give all this to you, Lord Jesus, in your, in your beautiful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.